Welcome to Ask the Tech Coach, brought to you by the TeacherCast Educational Network. If you are in charge of professional development and looking to build an innovative digital learning experience, this is the podcast for you. Join us each week as we uncover strategies that tech coaches are using to drive their digital transformations one classroom at a time. And now for your host, with over two decades of experience working with tech coaches and ed tech companies from all around the world, Jeff Bradbury. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury, and thank you so much for joining us today and making TeacherCast your home for professional development. This is Ask the Tech Coach podcast, episode number 140. And with me, as always, is Susan Vincent. Sue, how are you today? Welcome to Ask the Tech Coach. I am great. It feels like it's been a while since I've talked to you, Jeff. We we were uh, caught up on some episodes and um, we're counting down at school and the home stretch towards summer. So it's just been a busy time as with all of you listening out there, I'm sure. It is certainly getting into the end of May. And as we look forward towards the end, we've got some great stuff happening over at Ask the Tech Coach. We've got some great episodes all about how you guys can organize your digital selves, how you guys can get your teachers ready for the summertime. But Sue, today we're talking all about presentations because it is officially ISTE season. It is time for us to be doing those summer things. Ed camps are starting to come back. Virtual conferences are still around and those RFPs are all over the place, but it's not just for the big conferences. Today, we're here to talk about how tech coaches can just level up their own professional game. So you've been doing some presenting lately. Talk to us a little bit about what's been going on with you and with your website, techimaginations.net. Yeah, so I've been preparing. In fact, I have a proposal in for FETC 2022 in January. They're supposed to be face-to-face. I'm so excited about that. And just working on some other presentations locally, getting ready for summer PD and, um, you know, gearing back up for conference season here in Kentucky as various things happen in some of the regional areas. So um, gearing up for that. So we thought it would be a great time to start talking about, you know, getting yourself out there as a tech coach to present at these conferences coming up. Absolutely. There's a lot of great stuff that we're going to be dealing with today. And, you know, I got to say before we start, I am so proud of my group of instructional coaches uh, from my school district over the last month or so. We put together an entire seven Six. It was six course um, introduction to Microsoft Teams training, and it was an amazing experience. It was all for building leaders, department leaders, uh, central office staff, and it was really the introduction to what it was. We broke it down into six different modules from introduction to uh, creating meetings, working with files, channels versus posts. Uh, We did an introduction to OneNote, and even we wrapped it up with doing an introduction to SharePoint, intranets, how everything in Microsoft really wraps up. I am so proud of them. They did a great job working together. It was like our first um, team event. It really, really was. And the the first time the district had a chance to... It was it, it, right. It was like being with, you know, get, seeing the Avengers for the first time. It was awesome. And even even though one person was teaching a module, uh, modules were like 45 minutes or you know an hour or so. Um, we had all other instructional coaches in the room helping out, answering questions, uh, you know, putting things together. Everybody in the district had an intro. They had, uh, you know, the, the module that they came to, or six in this case, and then we did a quiz at the end. They got badges. It was really, really good. And um, I'm so proud of the team that we've built this year. You know, we started off the year with one instructional coach and we're ending. We actually just hired a brand new instructional coach. So that gives us seven instructional coaches plus a fantastic coordinator admin in front of in charge of everything and it has been such a great year we're going to be dissecting all of this Uh, Sue, my hope is that we can get a few of them on the show sometime between now and the end of the summertime to start to talk a little bit about the experience how it worked and everything so um it is about presentations 
We are here to talk about this, but we are not talking about it alone. We want to hear from you guys. Of course, we love it when you head on over to askthetechcoach.com. Subscribe to the show on all the famous podcasting players from Apple to Google, Amazon, Spotify, you name it. That's where we are for the last 140 episodes. This has to be one of the longest running, Sue. Uh, tech coach, digital learning yes. coach, whatever you want to call us, uh, podcasts that are out there. And so let's just kind of talk about this. Um, presenting. We all as coaches probably got into our jobs because we like presenting. We, we, we were in the classroom working with students and kind of said there's got to be something else out there. Or maybe we were fancying the Ed Camps or the ISTEs or stuff like that and said, okay, how do I get better at this? Sue, do you remember – way back remember your first presentations and what they were like i do i in fact i wasn't even a tech coach yet at that time it was just in my district that i was working with and they needed um someone to help present to the new teachers about um just the technology in our district and at that point i guess i was becoming one of the leaders i was a library media specialist at the time and you know, I start, that's where I started presenting, except for just my small group of teacher teammates there. And I helped with the district presentation of um, new teacher training, what we offered, how to get on the network. And this was 16 years ago <laughs> or more, 20 wait, years wait ago. A minute, wait a minute. Did yeah. you do the presentation called This is the Internet? Probably. Really and truly, it was probably pre-Google before this, because I kind of remember when Google came. I'm that old. So, so I, yes, I, I, it's I been do a that. while. Take, take me back, Sue. I'm going to Sue. Was it Sue Vincent's at the time? Was that was that your... No, it was. A, I had a different last name at the time. I, I'm going to, Su, Su, to Susie's presentation, and she's talking all about the 56 baud modem. Is yeah, how we're doing much. This? something like that. Yes. But yeah, I guess it stuck. And that's where I kind of developed my passion. And it just kind of grew from there. And then we that's got the awesome. opportunity for tech coaching. And here I am today. I remember my first presentations a, a few school districts ago, getting up nervous, you know, trying to trying to be that awesome person up there. You know, you, you've got your slide deck and you're sitting there going, OK, do I want one word per slide or many words per slide or bullet points or trying flashing, to uh, flashing uh, text? Oh, right. You have all the flashing text going around and all you're sitting there going is, I hope just somebody shows up to this thing. I hope somebody mm -hmm. shows up to this thing. And they do. And they're 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 grateful, and you realize that no matter what, you know, uh, you still, as the presenter, kind of have the advantage over the group. You're the one leading it, of course. You kind of know more about the subject than they do. But over time, you kind of have your eyes a little bit wider. You become Google Level One certified, maybe an Apple educator, something like that, going on. Mm -hmm. And then next thing you know, here you are. So let's talk a little bit about this. Five. We started with five, but I think we're up to like 10 now. So we've grown we'll, now. Yeah, we, we've grown a few things because we keep trying to top ourselves here. But we're not really talking about, you know, how, but what, I guess, today. But but memorable presentations. Like when you're looking to be a presenter up there, what is it about being a presenter that's going to be memorable? In my opinion of all of this stuff, um, you can't be a presenter unless you have an audience. And it doesn't matter if you're doing this for your teachers or even for your students or at an ed camp or even su submitting to ISTE. You need to have a catchy title for your presentation. Not only do you have to have a catchy title, you also need to have a catchy description, right? Um, yes. Five ways to use Google Docs is one way of putting it. Um, Iron Chef Google Apps for Education is another way of putting it. What's... What say you about titles and descriptions? Well, yes, that's definitely, you know, even as a participant at a conference before I got on to the conference circuit myself, that's what drew me into that presentation. You know, you think of those people out there that we consider rock stars at conferences that you go to and think of the titles of their presentations and what they talk about and how that relates and what makes you want to go into that session. And if I you don't know the person, it's usually the title. 
I, I remember trying to be cute with all of this stuff, right? Like you go to your first ISTE and you see people like Adam Bello, Steve Dembo, John Carippo, um, amazing presenters, people that know their stuff, know how to capture an audience, know how to bring people into the room. And yeah, they have the Iron Chef this and they have the family feud of ed tech and they've got you name it, they're doing it. I remember bringing that same concept back to my district and falling absolutely flat on my face because they weren't ready for it. They were not interested in, you know, here's some Play-Doh and I want you to take out your phone and I want you to do your own stop motion animation using Play-Doh and we're going to use your phone to use the Google Slides app. So it it was horrible. It, over their it, head. It was over their heads. I'll be honest. I did it at a major conference. It worked like a charm. But doing it for your own school district, sometimes you're too cool for the room, right? Absolutely. You know, you have to have that great title. And then that segues into our second way to create a memorable ex- presentation is know your audience and you need to tailor your presentation accordingly don't go over their head you know sometimes the people in your district are not those people that you see at an ed tech conference necessarily and you just like students you have to know where they are and so what i found from there is you do need to realize who you're speaking to Everybody's an amazing educator, but only at an ed camp can you do a session called 25 Chrome extensions you can't live without. When you do your Monday meetings, you do this Chrome extension and why you can't one. live without it. You do one. And mm-hmm. if the room is is, is kind of warm, you do two, maybe, yes. maybe three, right? But you certainly want to focus things because, you know, you might only have 10 minutes. And a 10 minute presentation might take you half an hour, but you never know. But knowing your audience and how to tailor it to them is good. So you have to know who's in front of you and where you're doing this. I think an ISTE presentation sometimes is different than an EdCamp presentation. And it's certainly different than a PD class on a Monday afternoon. And that's certainly different than walking into a classroom with your bunch of teachers and just talking about things. Exactly. I would even say that an ISTE presentation is different than an FETC presentation. Oh yes. Yes. I don't know why, but, but it, it just, it does feel like it's a little bit different. You know, maybe it's just, it's a different field, different co- conference. I don't know. But what, what advice do you have when you're tailoring your presentations to your audience? Well, yeah, definitely try to get to know, you know, hopefully you've been a participant in whatever conference yourself. You've you've had some experience two to three years of attending it yourself before you decide you're ready to present. And you kind of know the type of people that go to these presentations. So just be an observer first. And then like we just been saying, know your audience and, you know, Put your feelers out there to colleagues in other districts. What are your teachers wanting? What do they want? Who's coming from your district to this conference? What can I contribute? Let's stop there for a second, because when we're looking at this, and we'll talk a little bit about this later on down the road, but do you end up creating multiple versions of your presentation depending on where you're going? Yes. Or is that just me? <laughs> yeah, yes. And they eventually evolve because, you know, I will have either already presented it to my teachers in probably a basic manner, and then I'll upgrade it for a conference presentation or vice versa. I'll have this awesome, engaging conference presentation that I need to not, I don't know if downgrade is the right word, but to tailor it to my teachers in order to get them engaged and to learn the material too. So, so yes, it, it very much evolves one way or the other as you move forward. I tend to make my presentation decks with a lot of links. I, I'm not a big fan of hyperlinking, hyper, I'm not a big fan of doing stuff like that, but when it comes to creating these decks i will have one slide that might say hey here's the save to google keep chrome extension yes but when you click on that slide it'll take you to another slide deck just about that particular chrome extension right that's the one that i'll use at my school 
or that's the one that if I'm working one to one with a teacher, I'll, I'll take similar. that out. But yes. I've, you know, you, you, you put all those, th- it's like blog posting, right? Like you do multiple small blog posts and then suddenly you've got a PDF, yeah. similar concepts to everything. So that way, no matter where you are, you don't have to feel like, cause nobody wants to see your presentation where you're skipping over things for time. So I tend to make my, my, my slide decks easy. So that way I can get to the end of whatever the presentation is and, I might start the presentation at an ISTE or a bigger conference or whatever like that. I, I might not know where the ending of the presentation is going to be because it all depends on who's in front of you. Absolutely, because it could go various directions depending on their participation and engagement. Now, let's talk about number three because number three is very interesting. Uh huh. So number three, we talk about know your limitations. And I don't know if you're anything like me – You've had these high hopes of, oh, I want to present at this. I'm going to go ahead and sign up. And then it gets closer to the time and you're like, oh, my goodness, I don't have time for that. I'm going to have to either bow out or I'm going to be stressed to the max and getting it ready. So know your limitations before signing up. Ask yourself, do you have time? Do you have something valuable to contribute? You know, don't don't sign up just for the sake of presenting if you don't have anything new to contribute because you don't want the same old mundane mundane how-to session. Make sure you have something engaging and innovative. See, I, I agree with that. And and I, I, I take the stand-up comic approach to presentations, right? If I know that I'm going to be presenting something at an ISTE, you generally know six to eight months ahead of time, yes. right? Um. I'm going to find a bunch of ed camps to go to to try out the material. Mm -hmm. I'm going to probably make some YouTube videos to try out the material. We're going to do a podcast on the topic to try out the material. Mm -hmm. So that way, by the time I get to ISTE, I've done the presentation a few different times. I've said the information a few different ways. You bet I've got a presentation where even if the slides don't work, like technology does, you know, that, that. 56 baud modem that you were talking about doesn't work. Um, I can get up there and, and entertain a room with no visuals whatsoever. Absolutely. And I, I think that's a, you know, I, again, that's the, I call that the stand up comic because, you know, you know, comics don't just go to HBO and start talking. They're, they're clubbing it, for, trying to figure out what the right word, the right sentence, the right inflection, the right order of material. I do that a lot. Yeah. I do that a lot with the presentations. And you you got to be prepared. You really can't walk into an ISTE or an FETC or a, a major conference cold. You can do that with an ed camp because you might have six people. You might have 30 people. Um, and, it you know, it's it's very. That's the informal nature of those. Very informal nature. There you go. Right. But I, I would make sure that you're, you're testing out that material and you've got everything. And, you know, you're walking in with a backup plan to your backup plan to your backup plan. And if not. Yes here's the left turn if you need to but definitely know what you're getting into i always say make sure that anything that you get accepted to you can riff on without any without any technology whatsoever we've all been there the internet drops the the you you, the dongle isn't in your backpack not that i'm saying anything specifically about about a previous experience but we've all been there Mm-hmm. So know what you're able to do, know where how you're able to, and be able to put on a thing. You know, I always say you should be able to make a presentation in the middle of a desert, and Absolutely. and make a good presentation. What are your what what are your strategies for preparing for these things, big big or small? Well, very much like you, start small. You know, have have done it with your teachers at your school. If you're a tech coach, you should be already have mentioned it in some form or fashion to your teachers and then work your way up you know around here in kentucky and i'm sure it's like that where you guys live you have so many little regional ed camps and uh, teach meets and those types of things and then we have our state conference work your way up to from those smaller groups before you try to go on to the national scene so what's our fourth so our fourth one is know your time frame of the actual presentation and plan accordingly. You know, don't, you know, nobody wants to sit there and listen to you talk for a whole 50 minutes. 
you want some time to engage, you want some time for discussions, depending on what type of presentation, you know, be aware of that when you sign up. Because many times if you're signing up for FETC or ISTE, there's concurrent sessions, there's workshop sessions, there's um, auditorium sessions and I don't know, what are those 10 minute quick talk things called? I forget, but there are those little smackdown sessions and those types of things. So be aware of what you're signing up for and the time frame that you have and plan your presentation accordingly. You know, you may not need a 50 minute lecture. You may need a 25 minute lecture and a 25 minute discussion time to engage the audience or hands on activities, what have you. I, I totally agree. You know, you should be ready to riff. You should also be ready to go long form. Um, many of the presentations I've been doing recently are hour long things. I just got done doing a conference um, where he gave me 20 minutes and you got to know where to cut. You got to, you know, that whole yes. my, my favorite button hide slide, right? You just mm -hmm. take 20 minutes out of your presentation and you move on again. Nobody wants to see you skipping slides. So you just never show them on their presentation. Exactly. You just you know where you're going. And speaking said, of riffing, yeah. you know, be ready for that person in the audience who's going to ask you a question and they may follow it up with three, four, five more questions. And it may be just trying to get you off your game to see if you know it because they may be an expert or it just may be literally they're trying to learn and they really don't understand. It can go either way, but be ready for that person. <laughs> And how do you handle that person? <laughs> Very carefully. Many of us at our school, we probably have teachers that do that in PDs that just always have a question. So, Everybody you right know, now is thinking about that person. <laughs> yeah, who is that person? So, and almost in every one of my conference presentation experience, there's been that person who just is thinking, and in this case, it might not be the best kind of thinking outside of the box. They just are just... I don't know, trying to turn and go 45 degrees in the wrong direction. But, you know, be calm and collected and flexible. Again, that takes experience and knowing your audience and having that practice we just uh, talked about in the other item there. Let's talk a little bit about number five. This is something that we just kind of covered a little bit. But, Sue, what is number five? So this one is talking about your slides, your visual aids, whatever you're using, poster, digital posters, what have you, but make it fit the presentation. Don't just do a slide deck just to do a slide deck. You know, there's many times I've done presentations and I'm like, do I really need slides for that? Hmm. No, because I'm showing how to use, I don't know, vocabulary and or Flipgrid and I don't need slides to tell what Flipgrid is. I have Flipgrid right there. I just bring it up and show it and demonstrate it. And maybe you have slides that you're not using to present with, and that's going to kind of segue into the next one, which we'll talk more about, is you have something for them to reference later. But yeah. don't do slides just to be fancy and have those slides, like we said earlier, uh, dancing in and out and flashing text and all that. You know, one of the things that I was working with with our instructional coaches is their use of slides. When do you have a slide that says nothing? When do you have a slide that says a lot of things? When do you have graphics? When do you have di uh, dioramas and stuff like that? But also, when do you want to not use your slide and go into a live demonstration? Um, my philosophy on things is whenever you go into a live demonstration, you should also have a slide maybe with a small uh, animated graphic that shows the basic parts of it. Good so that point. way you can talk in front of that for a couple seconds and then dive in. Um, I, I do like uh, we, we, we've been talking about this a lot with our coaches. I, I It's not an Apple thing, but. It, it, you know, Apple always does it. I'm going to show you everything and now I'm going to demonstrate it. So if you have a slide that shows you how to go from point A to point B and you're talking about this feature, now you can cut the slide and literally go demo it. And so that way, if you do need to stand in front of the slide, because time is moving, you can at least have them understand the concept. If you need to, you know, riff or punt a little bit, then you can go to your computer and then you can demonstrate it and take questions yeah. on it. But always be able to have things, especially now when we're all doing virtual conferences, it's nice to have those slides where you don't have to have the embarrassment of changing your view or yes. you know, screen sharing or anything like that. 
it takes a little bit of time to get your slides created, but you have them. And, and, you know, it's easier to spend more, you know, 10 minutes or so extra creating a slide deck than getting to your presentation and kind of flopping, I think. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's so important to be ready to punt. Again, if you're trying to do a live demonstration and Flipgrid is not working because the Wi-Fi is down for whatever reason, then you have that sl those slides to fall back on. So, you know, it's very strategic planning when you look at those types of things. Now, the next thing, Sue, is something that I, I try to do with all my presentations, which is being able to have something that they can walk away with, right? Having something you can share with the audience, whether it be slides, handouts, uh, a do now, something in there. And I think that, you know, that's good for audiences. That's also, of course, good for your kids, making sure you've got your handouts and yeah. things. But I make sure that whenever I'm doing a big presentation, I have a website. There's always, you know, teachercast.net slash something. And, and that right. page usually is the opt-in, right? Usually in order for you to get there, you have to give me your email address. I, I, I know, but that's what you have to do. But through there, not only are they in the email, but also I have it set up and designed through my newsletter provider that an hour or so after the presentation, they automatically get an email that says thank you. And that thank you email introduces myself again. It gives my social links, but it also then gives a little tchotchke of, you know, here's the PDF, here's the video, here's the website again. Um, hey, tomorrow I'm going to check in on you to see how it's doing. And of course, I probably wrote that email four years ago when I was setting these things up. But the point is, they don't know that. And it's really, really nice. It's nice to have that personalized mm -hmm. communication, even if it's automatic. Right. And then those teachers in those presentations, they like to have something tangible that they can take with them. You know, yes. it's more memorable. They're going to remember your session if they have, you know, a template that you've shared with them, a choice board that you've shared with them that they can go back and customize for themselves. They're going to appreciate that so much instead what? of just sitting there for 45 minutes listening to someone talk at them. You know, one of my favorite parts of all the presentations is when I just have to say to them, don't worry about writing everything down. You'll get it at the end of this. And then, then you hear this have, big sigh of relief. Right. Then they actually can have a conversation with you where they can actually do it. And they don't have to worry about things. And, you know, I, I show them how it all works. I show them how, you know, this is what we're going to do here. Right. But um, it's just a matter of giving them more than they were expecting and making sure that they can walk away being able to do something, right? Making sure that they can do something. Um, they'll remember you for that. They'll 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 subscribe yes. to your podcast. They'll they'll go to your techimaginations.net. See what I just did there? And right over to TeacherCast. And right thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll, of course. Um, so look, we have our titles, we have our description, we we know who our audience is. We're we're calm, we're cool, we're we're ready for all this stuff. What is that number seven thing that we need to be worrying about? So confidence, definitely. And, you know, we, you talk about confidence all throughout your life, but, you know, you're up there. Maybe you're a first time presenter. Maybe you've, you're a veteran presenter. You know, I still have to remind myself to be confident that I know my material and my content that I'm presenting and my experience is behind me and I'm going to be able to be successful in this presentation. I think that's it, right? It's, it's getting up there and knowing your stuff, right? Knowing that you can riff all over the place of this, knowing that, you know, if technology fails, but also having the confidence that, no, you 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 are in command of that room. I do see a lot of teachers not remembering that they are professional speakers. They might be doing it with first graders. They might be doing it with 18 yes. year olds, but they are professional speakers. And whether you're doing it in front of a bunch of kids or ISTE, um, you're professional, you know, you, 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 you know how to do this. And I'm not, look, we're, we're, I'm not blind to the fact of when you're presenting in front of your kids, that's different than presenting in front of your teachers. Um, mm -hmm. Presenting in front of your teachers is different than presenting in front of your admin. Yes. Um, presenting in front of your admin is certainly different than pro promote, uh, presenting in front of a bunch of strangers at an ed camp or bigger than an ed camp. I mean, I think the, the largest room I've ever had was it was a couple thousand people at an ISTE. And it was amazing just to be in front of, of everything and just just soaking it all in. Yes. Um, but definitely having the confidence that you are here because you are the expert in this room. Somebody else might know more about it. And if they do, 
having that confidence to give that person the floor, they always say, don't give the microphone away. But if somebody has a good point, it's better to have them on your side than to be sitting there going, who are you and what are you doing here? So totally have the confidence to let somebody else, you know, work with you on this stuff and ask them. I I like to work the crowd when I do the, when I do the bigger presentations, because Everybody has a different way, let's say, to make a podcast. So you tell me what you like to do. You tell me what, what microphone works for you. I'm only going to tell you what works for me and make some recommendations yes. for you. But confidence is absolutely everything. How do you how do you handle things? I mean, I've seen you present in small groups and big groups. But how, how do you feel you are with uh, handling the pressure, yo? Just experience, knowing I have experience behind me and I've been doing this for so long and you know, remembering I've been successful at this before, you know, you know, even after almost 20 years of doing this, I still get butterflies in my stomach and my voice starts shaking when I get into that room full of people. But once I get going and I start spouting off the material, knowing my content, I become more and more confident as I go along. And then when that rifting happens, the discussions come, those questions come, I'm able to connect with the crowd. And then that's what kind of feeds me and lights the fire we've come a long way let's talk Mm -hmm. about number eight Mm -hmm. so for that last one and jeff you mentioned this while ago and i'm sure we've all suffered from this is be familiar first of all with what's being provided in your presentation room or auditorium or classroom make sure you know what material is being provided and you know, if you've been doing this a while, hopefully you have some hardware on hand of your own that you can make work in a pinch. Now, that doesn't always happen, and then we have to go with plan B and wing it a little bit sometimes. But be familiar with the hardware that you'll be using, what's being provided, laptop, dongles, cables, and, those and, types of things. And, and let's dive into what that means, right? You know, it, it's a weird question to ask, but I often ask, what kind of a board am I going to be presenting on? Now, I, I would never do that at my schools. I would never do that at an ed camp. But if it's at an ISTE or if it's at a bigger conference, yeah. Um, you know, when I when I give a keynote, like, w- w- what am I presenting on? Do I want to make 16 by 9 or do I want to make 4 by 3 slides? Absolutely. Um, you don't want to be sitting there in front of a huge board that you've got the wrong dimensions of your slide deck on, on, on either side of that on, uh, that, right. that ball game. You want to make sure that you're familiar with all that stuff. Um, y- you want to also make sure that you have your own, you know, again, not everybody, but a backup Wi-Fi solution sometimes works. I mean, I've been known to pull, yes. pull stuff from my phone if I needed to, if I'm in a hotel or whatever. Um, you you need to know what kind of stuff you'll be using and what kind of things you have. Right. And coming from the other side, um, I, I, 2017, I was the KISTE president here in Kentucky and was in charge of organizing our state conference. And before that, and learning from my um, predecessors, we are very um, methodical about making sure we let presenters know what's going to be available in the conference rooms. And then if they need other equipment, you need to bring your own. But we provide this, this, and this. So I think it's important for the conference, if anybody out there is in charge of conferences, make sure you let your presenters know what will be available so then they can plan accordingly. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, coming at it from a pre- presenter coach's point of view is just as important. Um, light slides versus dark slides might even be a good conversation point for, for where we are right now. You know, yes. um, if I'm on certain boards, if I know I'm working with a teacher and they've got a board that I know is kind of light, I might reverse my slides and make them white text on dark background. Right. Versus making a white slide with, you know, thin point font. Do you have older um, projectors versus TV screens versus a hundred percent, whatever. So there's a lot of different things in there. Um, you know, obviously being familiar with the hardware is also your hardware, making sure, you know, we we've all seen it happen where someone's giving a presentation and on the board is the presenter view of PowerPoint. Um, yeah. Knowing, knowing how to flip that is an important little keyboard shortcut sometimes. Yes. 
So we would like to know what you guys are thinking here, because really what it comes down to is we want to make sure that our coaches are out there presenting, being memorable. You know, when the feedback comes back, it's positive. And it's not just, hey, it was great. It really is the feedback of, no, like Sue did a great job. I can't wait to see her next. Or, hey, I saw Sue present. I'm going to go subscribe to that podcast of hers. Making sure that you are memorable, making sure that you're able to build your brand through your presentations. We're certainly going to be deep diving into this more on the Jeff Bradbury Show. You can head on over to buildyouredubrand.com to learn more about that stuff. And, of course, we've got some great guests coming up that are going to be talking about this very subject. So don't forget to check that stuff out. But, Sue... I am looking forward to the summertime. I'm looking forward to more of the great coaching stuff. Um, I'm excited that we're now partnering up with our friends over at the Teach Better Podcast Network. They've got 30 amazing podcasters out there all trying stuff out from, you know, ed tech to leadership to coaching now to how to do things to to general education. They've got a lot of great stuff over at uh, teachbetter.com. You can check them out and check out all the great stuff over there at Teach Better and the Teach Better Speaker Bureau. Um, If you're looking for some good presenters, there's a lot of good stuff over there. And you know what? We're also now broadcasting live once or twice a month with Google Educator Group New England. Uh, So you'll be going to be seeing some of that great content sprinkled in. In fact, last week we had that show. So we're excited to be working with uh, some of our friends, Jed Judkins and, and everybody from the New England Google Educators Group. And we would love to hear from you guys. Don't forget to reach out to us on Twitter at Ask the Tech Coach. Leave us a voice message. And you know, Sue, we haven't even mentioned yet our Teacher Cast Tech Coaches Network is still alive yes, and well. And every more. single Wednesday, we're doing our Tech Coach Roundtable for as long as we possibly can. Uh, some of you guys might have heard I'm starting a starting back in grad school, starting from my doctorate program. So uh, we're trying to get as much done here as possible. And oh, by the way, Sue, we're writing a book. So there's a lot of great stuff happening over here. If you'd like to get in on some of these great episodes or be a guest, we would love to hear from you guys. Sue, um, are you wrapping up your Tech Tip Tuesdays on YouTube or are you going to be planning to do that throughout the summer? Um, I'm not sure. I may take a hiatus for a few weeks, but um, one of our school campuses over across the river in Indiana, they actually start in late July. They get a shorter summer and get more breaks throughout the year. So I may take a little break through June and start back up after um, Independence Day and move on from there. But I've been focusing lately on cleaning up and archiving for the end of the year and some of the new things that are coming up, coming out on um, the new Chrome OS is on the Chromebook. So that was featured this week. So take a look at that screen recorder feature on the Chromebooks. We will certainly be tweeting out all of that stuff over at Ask the Tech Coach. We want to say thank you as we wrap up 140 episodes of Tech wow. Coach Goodness. And here, Sue, is to another 140. we got a lot of great stuff coming up. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel over at teachercast.net slash YouTube. And one last time, guys, thank you so much for joining us and making TeacherCast your home for professional development. On behalf of Sue and everybody here on TeacherCast, my name is Jeff Bradbury, reminding you guys to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students. You've been listening to Ask the Tech Coach, hosted by Jeff Bradbury of the TeacherCast Educational Network. Please reach out to the show with all of your questions on Twitter at Ask the Tech Coach or online at www.askthetechcoach.com. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. And please take a moment to write a review in the App Store.